Tonight's talk is called The Fractal Brain and the Fractal Genome. So basically, in the world today, there are two massive problems. In our, they are basically brain and mind. Another problem is genome. So basically, you know, how does the brain work? No one knows. So people say the answer is 50 years away, 50 to 100 years away. The genome has been sequenced, but no one knows how it works. And people say this is the next step. And they say it's, it's decades away. OK, the answer. What I propose is basically, with the fractal brain theory, there's actually one solution for both of them. So the fractal brain theory, the fractal brain, actually, the fractal extends to the cell, the subcellular level. OK, this is very exciting <laughs> a kind of uh, uh, way of looking at things. Um, OK, we'll go, that's a fractal globule. That's a very new finding. That's how DNA is arranged. So basically, we'll talk about it later on. Um, this book came out 2015, and um, it's called The Future of the Brain. And uh, basically, uh, 25 top neuroscientists in the world they basically discuss what's the next step for neuroscience. It's well, well, well recommended, 2015, brand new. Occurring uh, sentiment is basically that it's all this knowledge about neuroscience, so basically that there's need for unification. So, so it's free unifications, there's all the details of neuroscience, all these facts uh, and you know, uh, uh, knowledge about neurons and kind of neurotransmitters, but how does it all come together to make the brain work? No one knows. And also, the, the second one is basically um, reconciling mind and brain. So you have the mind, parts list of cognition, and the parts list of neurobiology, but you have to reconcile the two. And that's another big integration that people are saying, you know, how do you do it? And the third one, that is discussed a lot in this book, in, in five of the chapters, in fact, is um, the link between the genome and the brain and behavior. Obviously, there is a link, you know, mental illness and behavior, but what is that link? So we think there's actually a single theory to describe all of it. And we believe there's one symmetry, one basically pattern that extends all the way through. That sounds quite wild until you realize that look, everything that's ever happened in your life, everything you've ever done, every protein that's ever been manufactured in your body, okay, your entire body, your entire life, everything that's ever happened has emanated from a fertilized egg, hasn't it? Basically. Now, if there's a way of describing, okay, the process by which a fertilized egg becomes your body and brain and a symmetry between behavior thought and actions so you know it's a continuous process because everything in your life has started from that point so you can find a single language to describe that emanation okay and then find a symmetry of process to encode it so you know it's a continuum you know it's a continuum you know, you know there is a continuous process what i'm saying is that there is one process and there's one underlying algorithm behind it basically the idea is that you take three principles to work out how the brain and genome works, and these are three fundamental principles. So this is a bit of background for the, the talk. The, the three principles are symmetry, self-similarity, i.e. fractals, and recursivity. Okay, so uh, symmetry, okay. If I, if I had to sum up science in one word, then that one word would be symmetry. Because what is science? Science is the process of uh, finding patterns of nature, isn't it? Finding the patterns of nature. But it's more than that, because it's about finding the patterns behind the patterns, the unifying patterns, the meta-patterns. The patterns that show that all the separate patterns are the same pattern. OK, so you know, here, well, here we've got these uh, separate patterns. OK, so basically, that's the original pattern. The two principles behind symmetry are transformation and invariance. So basically, we've got basic shape. We transform it, we translate it, we scale it, we rotate it and scale it. But you know, fundamentally, that's the same shape. So the transformation and variance, the shape is transformed, but it's invariant, it stays the same. So transformation, a kind of seeming superficial difference, but at the same time, invariance. Now, um, self-similarity, i.e. fractal, is like nested symmetry. It's when you take the original shape, you make a smaller copy of itself, and you place it within itself. Okay, so you see the same shape, as you've got smaller copies. Then I do the same thing again to a smaller scale, and I recursively do it again and again and again. That's recursivity. So you've got three, three related concepts, symmetry, self-similarity, and recursivity, and actually related. And, and they're fundamental. So, you know, um, fractals or self-similarity has been called the geometry of nature. So, you know, symmetry and self-similarity are fundamental. Recursion is basically how the universe works. The people think the universe is recursive. That's how microchips work. It's how, how, you know, computation works. Life is recursive. Okay. There's, uh, okay, these are kind of like uh, common fractals, you know, kind of Romanesque broccoli. These, so these are kind of mathematical fractals. Okay, so basically that's self-similarity. Now, um, uh, just an example of uh, recursive functions. Okay, basically we talk about this a lot later on in the genome section. The idea of cell division is a recursive process. So the cell becomes two, then the same process repeats, becomes four, becomes, that's recursion, isn't it? The same function is happening again and again. And suddenly you get billions and billions of cells. And um, so we could talk about this a lot, because um, that's how fertilized egg becomes your entire body. Okay. 
Now, um, the, 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 that's a divergent recursive process, and this is a convergent recursive process. So like a tennis match, you've got, you know, you've got your quarterfinals and they play, and then the semifinals, and then you know, it's, a, it's a, like a roots of a tree, it's converging towards a point. So it's, it's a convergent recursive process. Now you can, you can imagine everyone in the world plays this huge tennis tournament, okay? And then like, like this convergent tree, and the winner of this tennis tournament becomes the king and queen, or queen, and queen of the world. Okay, so you can imagine it, can't you? I mean, no, I mean, some people do imagine those, those kind of things, but that's another talk for another day. <laughs> so imagine, you know, so, so basically that there is this kind of sort of recursive process to a point that's convergent and recursive process that's divergent. Okay, I kind of drifted off into a bit of irrelevance there. We'll, okay, we'll keep it uh, focused now. Um, now. Now, another concept uh, which we're going to introduce, which is absolutely fundamental, which is fundamental for neuroscience, also for uh, computer science and artificial intelligence, is, is binary trees. Okay. Now that's a tree, that's a kind of tree of a neuron, and these are other neurons, and that's a binary tree. It just simply means that it's a tree and the branches are always in two. They're always branch in binary, okay? That's a binary tree. Now, um, binary trees are fundamental and they're actually the simplest fractal, one of the simplest fractals you can possibly define. So it's, you know, so a tree is self-similar. And this is mathematically one of the simplest fractals there is. And it's also symmetrical, so each branch is a perfect symmetry of every other branch. So it's a nested symmetry. And it's a recursive function. So a binary trees captures, in, in essence, recursivity, symmetry, and, and self-similarity. Uh, in essence, you know. So now, um, okay, with binary trees, that's also a binary tree. Can you see? It's just the same thing, but kind of made into a fractal grid. And uh, <coughs> okay, that's a binary tree, and I've, I've rotated that, that round. I've kind of extended the nodes, and I can use binary trees to represent grids. See? And uh, so I've recursively made a bigger grid. And you know, in those squares I'm going to put uh, pixels either black or white and I can draw I can draw little pictures can't I like a like a, a JPEG like you take a camera uh, a phone on your sorry you take a picture on your camera phone so so it, which means I can represent things okay so um, binary trees can also represent time so here basically this binary tree is not representing space I mean these are pictures but this is succession in time so I'm using binary trees to represent a sequence okay in time which could, could also be in space as well, because this could be just a sequence of, uh, of, of, of DNA represented by a d binary tree. Now, just a bit of a technical um, kind, of, kind of background to explain uh, for the rest of the talk, basically. And this idea of combinatorial codes. Now, it sounds like a fancy language. I mean, don't, so don't leave the room. It's like a fancy term. It's scary. But you, you use combinatorial codes every day when you write letters of the alphabet. These, you know, put le letters of the alphabet in combination. You make words. And that's a combinatorial code. And uh, you know, num numerals, you know, zero to nine, you put them together, you make numbers. That's a combinatorial code. Now, um, a binary combinatorial code is basically when you can only use zero and one. So it's a binary combinatorial code. Simple as that. Okay. <coughs> now, if you've got a binary tree like that, that, that's called a spatial coding. If each, no, if each one of these nodes you use to represent something. So that, that first node could represent Paul, George, Ringo, and who's the other guy? Um, John. Okay, so that's kind of like, you know, spatial coding. And it's not very, not very efficient because like, to represent everyone on the planet, you need, you know, seven, seven billion little beads. So it's not very efficient. Should we use combinatorial coding? So, okay, um, with combinatorial coding, you see, with those four boxes, you put a zero or one. Can you see, as I go across, if I put a, a 0 or 1 in the first box, that's two combinations. But as I go across, I make four combinations, and, as I, uh, and, this, and so on. And here are all the combinations of 0 and 1 I can put in those four boxes. And there are actually 16 combinations I can represent. Okay? So, you know, it's, it's become more powerful already. I can, I can do the same with time. Instead of, uh, now I've actually got one kind of, uh, you know, box. Well, actually, the same box is, is moving in time now. So the next time step, I can put 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And which basically, in four time steps, with one box, I can represent 16 things again. And I can combine space and time, so each of these boxes represents 16 things, but then I animate it in four time steps, and suddenly I can represent 65,000 things. Surely, though, you can't have space without time and vice versa. Exactly, yes, exactly. So basically, if you, you know, take these four uh, boxes to... Uh, you know, um, 10 billion brain cells, then obviously that's representing a very complex kind of thing we can do. So, so basically, this is a very simple way of explaining combinatorial space. Now, the thing about binary trees, okay, is that they're hierarchical. Can you see that's top and that's bottom? So it's kind of an intrinsically hierarchical nature to, to binary trees. And uh, this brings out more in, in kind of uh, 
you know, kind of makes it more explicit. So that's a binary tree, and that's defining boxes. And so basically, you can see there's a hierarchy. So that's the top, and that contains these enclosed boxes. So that's top and that's bottom. That's the container, and these are all contain contained. So it's kind of hierarchy in binary trees. And the same when we, when we go across, like we did earlier on. We went, we went across sideways in, in, in space, and that's like uh, directories on a computer. So you're going across, you also, you also you got another hierarchy, so that's top and that's down. So, you know, like computer directories, you know, basically you go across, but you, they're like nested folders, you can see, just to make, help you visualize. And basically we do the same with time, it just means, uh, hi, you know, binary trees are inherently hierarchical, and you've got this concept of you know, hierarchy and top and down, okay? So you can do it in space and, and time across. So, so that's basically the essence, the, the, the groundwork for basically explaining the genome and brain. So it's a bit of a technical background. I'm kind of whizzed through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the hard stuff's over, okay? <laughs> get, get, the, uh, get the tricky stuff over at the beginning. So, so now, already, um, this language is actually very close to the language of genes, isn't it? Because uh, genes, what are genes? They're, they're a combinatorial code. These are, these are your 23 chromosomes, okay, in a human being. And uh, basically, uh, you, know, you know, it's basically four letters, basically. So, so instead of a base two, uh, combinatorial code, you've got a base four combinatorial code, which you can easily represent with two bits. So already, uh, DNA is a combinatorial code. Okay, that's, that's what it is. And also, DNA can be represented with a binary tree, like we represented time. A sequence can be represented with a binary tree. And also, what DNA does, ontogenesis, i.e. the formation of my body, is also a binary tree, because the cells always divide in a binary way. So already, we have a way of looking at genes in our language, which is a very nice fit. What we're going to explain now Oh, just a bit of background. I mean, there's your classic uh, DNA, you know, you kind of uh, double helix. And it's basically, this is amazing, this is incredible. You've got two meters of DNA, okay, in each cell. And each cell, I mean, you can't, you can't see a cell. It's basically smaller than a speck of dust. That's how big a cell is. And it basically, that's crammed into, that's, it's not even crammed into the cell. It's crammed into the nucleus of the cell, which is a tiny little speck of the cell. I'll show how it's done. It's done in a fractal way. I'll show you later on, okay? It's, it's ingenious. It's actually brand new finding. Anyway, it's actually tightly bound in, in what's called chromatin. So it's actually not uh, loose strands like this. It's never loose like this. It's always bound in these kind of like beads on a string kind of format. Then it's kind of really compressed into these chromosomes. That, that, then it's kind of loosened out to, to make it function. So that's just that's how you know, it's organized, DNA. So you know, these two meter strands crammed into, your, into each nucleus. Now, okay, now the trick is to show how this binary language, this binary combinatorial code language, is everywhere in the brain. Absolutely, once you see the brain this way, there's no going back. Okay, absolutely no going back. Okay, um, just to quickly skim through some background of the entire brain, just to give you an overview of what the brain is. The brain is essentially flat sheets. So it's basically your cortex, okay, so that's drawn to scale. Your cerebral cortex, cortex is, 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 the cortex is the word for bark, which means it's basically like, it's crinkly, yeah? but actually flattens out to a flat sheet. Absolutely flat, slightly concave, and, that, and that's basically the shape of it. So you can see there's two massive flat sheets compressed into each, each side of your skull. So basically that's drawn to scale. That's, imagine that's the side of your head. So each side has these, a massive flat sheet. Now the flat sheet is compartmentalized into about 50 compartments, and further comp uh, you know, these compartments are further specialized into about 500. But you can see, like a patchwork quilt, that's the analogy, and each bit of patchwork that's the primary visual cortex, secondary visual cortex, you know, bits to do with primary hearing and all the secondary hearing cortex. You can see, it's like a basically, each little patch has a specialized function. Now, the other astounding thing is, is the modular organization. It's called a cortical column. It's about 0.3 millimeters diameter. Okay, and basically about a thousand neurons. Uh, that's a basic building block in a human brain, about several million. That's also found in a mouse brain. And it's the same diameter, the same architecture, the same number of neurons, the same layout as in the mouse brain. But basically, we use the same building block. We've replicated, you know, millions of times more than a mouse brain, which is, you know, a few thousand of these cortical columns. So, the other principle of the uh, brain is, is topographic mapping. So, um, as, as a cortical column, that's uh, basically if you show a monkey a, a pattern or show a human a pattern, that same pattern be projected on the visual cortex. So it's topographic mapping. If I trace out a kind of uh, an A on my skin, then a kind of A activity pattern will happen in my somatic smart sensory cortex, okay? So it's topographic mapping. It's like we, we process pictures, basically. So we, we work in images. We work in, you know, kind of graphs. Fascinating. 
<laughs> okay, so these, these are basic principles that then apply to other parts of your brain. So it's cerebellum at the back of your head. Okay, cerebellum. Now, can you see how crinkly that is? It's almost like fractally crinkly. But again, it flattens out to a flat sheet. Amazing, isn't it? So, um, you know, five centimeters is about two feet of cerebellum, flat sheet, like that. That's a human cerebellum flattened out. And it's basically really crumpled up, crinkly, crinkly, crinkly in the back of your head. And the same thing applies, topographic mapping, okay, and also uh, modular designs. So you've got your basic cerebellar circuit. This is astounding. The same basic cerebellar circuit is found in a shark brain. A, a rudimentary cerebellar circuit is found in a lamprey brain. <laughs> I mean, a lamprey isn't even a fish, so basically that's how evolution works. It's got a, a kind of part it can use. This works, and I'll replicate it you know, billions of times versus uh, a lamprey or a shark. And uh, the same with the, the stratum, topographic mapping. <coughs> and also this kind of stereotypical cool design also found in birds and reptiles. So, so you get the picture, kind of, it's actually qu quite simple underneath uh, all the complexity. It's the same building blocks used again and again. Now what's the basic recurring pattern in the brain? Um, okay, the, 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 public spe the speaker is a, is a tree-loving hippie. It's, it's, a, it's a tree, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tree, it's cool, isn't it? I love trees, you know. I don't hug them, but I, I do like trees. <laughs> we need them to survive. Anyway, the basic recurring pattern in the brain throughout is the tree. But un unlike normal trees, um, you know, roots going into the, the trunk and flowing out, um, th there's a, a kind of looping back pattern. So we go through the entire brain. These boxes are the, each of the bits of uh, cortex, the patchwork quilt. Then it's arranged as a hierarchy. So basically, um, th they're not kind of haphazardly arranged. So basically, um, they converge from the primary sensory cortices and they converge to the hippocampus. But can you see, it's like the roots of a tree, all your sensory modalities, they flow inwards to the hippocampus. And that's where it converges. You lose hippocampus and they can't form new memories. And uh, vice versa, the cingulate cortex, all your modalities of doing, thinking, moving arms and legs about, memorizing things. When you do something actively, volitionally, then it comes from the cingulate cortex. And that's like the, basically the branches of the tree branching out. And then uh, the cingulate cortex branching out would loop back into the hippocampus. You see, that's the entire brain. There's a hierarchy, again, you know, flowing in, flowing out, it's got a kind of top-down hierarchy. Now, um, the same pattern with a neuron, obviously, it's like a tree that dendrites like, you know, they call them arborizations. So, you know, dendri dendritic arborization, like a tree. So dendrites flowing into the cell body and uh, axons flowing out, then it's kind of looping back pattern. The cortical columns, all these separate inputs from other cortical columns flowing in, either neighboring or from uh, you know, distant parts of the brain, and flowing out to other parts of other uh, cortical columns, and it's looping back. And patches of cortex, we saw earlier, kind of flowing in, but also diverging out to, uh, and, and looping back. So this kind of same pattern, fractal pattern, occurring again and again at different scales. Now, how do we um, explain now the, the, bi the binary aspects? Uh, I'm going to show you that the binary thing is absolutely ubiquitous. And when you, when you see it, there's no going back. You can see that the brain is binary. It's absolutely uh, binary and digital, in fact. Now, there, there's a thing called, uh, a tradition called hemineglect. And basically, it's like you lose half your world. So basically, um, lose, lose your right parietal cortex. And you basically have a condition called hemineglect. And basically, uh, it's like you lose half your world. So the patient is asked to remember walking down the street where he grew up and recall the stuff to one side of the street, and he can do it. But when he's asked to recall the stuff on the other side of the street, he doesn't know what, what, what's there. He can't recall it. But when he's asked to walk to the end of the street where he grew up and turn around, and then he can recall the stuff on the other side of the street now. <laughs> when he's asked to kind of like a, you know, draw a flower, he can only draw half the flower. He can only draw half the clock. So he's lost half, lost half his world. And it's binary and it keeps subdividing because you tell him to eat a plate of food, he starts eating and then he stops. And then you turn the plate of food round, he starts eating, then he stops. So it's kind of subdividing his plate of food. Uh, it's, it's actually the um, right parietal lobes. Okay, right parietal lobes. And um, so, so you can see kind of, kind of this binary subdividing of the visual field, kind of dividing, dividing, dividing. So it's this binary, yeah? And um, spatial frequency, now this is slightly technical. When you break down vision, you basically analyze vision in terms of spatial frequency. So these are like spatial frequency gratings. And that's kind of twice the frequency. You can see that there's uh, six peaks and there's three. So that's twice the spatial frequency. Now, the micro features of perception, you basically break down everything you're looking at now in terms of spatial frequency. Now, the, the thing is, with uh, th these experiments to do called just noticeable difference experience, uh, experiments, you can tar out separate frequency bands and then the frequency bands above and below will not be affected. And basically, the frequency bands are one octave apart. 
Now, an octave is basically a doubling in frequency or, or halving frequency. So again, it's this kind of idea of doubling and halving, kind of basically that spatial frequency, there's a binary doubling pattern behind it. Okay, so the micro features of your visual perception. Now, um, the, the recent Nobel, the Nobel Prize last year for neuroscience, uh, basically it was to do with grid cells. It's basically, now I walk around this room, like that lady here in the room, basically as I walk in certain parts of the room, like here and here, grid cells in my brain will fire. At, a, at those points in the grid, okay. So it's like a like a tachometer. I can I can basically like a grid. I can mark out the the, 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 the this this room in my brain implicitly as a grid. It's basically as neurons in the hippocampus which do that. So I won a Nobel Prize last year. To cut a long story short, the important thing is that the grids they come in a certain scale ratio, and that scale is 1.42. And that's relevant because 1.42 is the square root of two. So times by 1.42 and times by, you double, you double again. You see, amazing, isn't it? From the eyes at spatial frequency to the frequency of my, my grid, my floor grid. <laughs> Incredible, yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay, just, just skip this, it's like this technical. <coughs> so, so space, we've dealt with space. Now time, now time. Um, we, we know from brain waves, basically, that we basically, we compartmentalize time. How do we know this? Because interesting experiments, gamma waves all over your brain, 40 hertz in your visual cortex. Now, with special electrodes, you can basically measure a person's gamma waves in the phase. Now, if I made a special film that only showed at the peaks of the gamma waves, okay, so, so basically half the time the film is off and half the time if the film is on, and it's, it's only on on the peaks, then you see the film fine. Now, with the electrodes, if I phase shift by 180 degrees, so it only shows at, at the troughs, you don't see it anymore. So it's the same film, but you face shifted it to the troughs, so you don't see it anymore. Now, uh, now a rabbit, when it sniffs, it's actually at six hertz a second, six hertz sniffing, you know, it's very fast. You know, you, you know rabbits, they sniff, don't they? Well, um, fe the feet wave is, is about five, six hertz, okay? And basically, um, if you um, try to potentiate a neuron at the trough of a feet wave, it doesn't learn, you, you, you don't learn it, basically. And the, the sniffing is synchronized to the feet wave of the rabbit's hippocampus. So again, as you can see, the, the sniffing is aligned with the pulse of the feet wave. So you learn, you, you take a sniff and it's pulsed at, at the peaks. So you put the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the pulses at the troughs, the rabbit doesn't learn anything, doesn't sniff anything, yeah? And the same with whiskers, uh, line to the feet wave, and also when you, when you scan your eyes around, it, it's micro saccades, it's do, it do another brain rhythm. So you see, it's, you know, basically it's pulsed and it's compartmentalized. And, um, and also, um, the brain waves, the actual uh, frequencies they come in, it's actually powers of two. So gamma waves are 40 hertz, beta waves 20, alpha waves 10, and theta waves between five and, five and six, roughly doubling. Now, the scientists weren't looking for a doubling pattern. This is just where the frequency bands are concentrated. You see, you see this kind of doubling pattern in, in the brain waves. Now, I think about music is basically that the octave is, is one of the most perfect harmonies. So you've got brain waves. It's not a cacophony. You know, it has to harmonize, doesn't it, to work. So basically, it's a simple proposition here is that it, it harmonizes in octaves. And this actually corresponds with the, uh, you know, the, uh, what we know from, from brain waves. <coughs> now, if we go to, um, to, to music, okay, music. Now, um, common time classical music, pop music, folk music, nursery rhymes, limericks, there's a certain beat pattern, there's a certain grouping of the beats. So, you know, four, group, four beats will be grouped into eight. Then there's eights to be grouped into sixteens, then there's sixteens to be grouped into thirty twos, and there's thirty twos to be grouped into sixty four. So again, you can see this kind of doubling pattern in the grouping of, of music. And the idea is basically you appreciate. Um, I, I've heard a song on top of the pops when I was free once, and then you know, I download it on you know uh, YouTube forty years later, and I, and I actually still know the, the song. I actually, remember the words. You know what I'm saying? Because it's easy to process. And the reason why is because it follows that doubling beat pattern. And you know, a simple proposition is, it's because your, your brain is working in the doubling binary mode. So, you know, basically we, we see all this kind of music which is accessible. So, so language, okay, language, okay, so, okay, uh, no, work of Noam Chomsky and related people, all sentences can be broken down in terms of binary trees. So any sentence, any language can be analyzed in binary trees. So here's a simple sentence, brains think, that's a binary tree and brains think binary, that's a binary. So any co sentence or any complexity, way thinks brains think binary, so basically that's a binary tree. So any uh, an entire book can be broken down in terms of binary trees. Now, okay, now uh, very recent research, very new research, okay. This is um, the actual um, 
syllables, you, when you speak syllables, okay, and, and the phonemes are processed using those same brain waves we talked about earlier. So basically, this was suspected for a very long time, but it's only recently, in the past, um, actually, few years, new research has actually proven this to be true. Basically, that it, it, the people have suspected that gamma waves at 40 hertz is perfect for processing phonemes, which is the micro features of your you know, sp speech sounds. And uh, it's been suspected for a long time that, um, that theta waves are perfect for processing syllables. It's at roughly that ballpark, 6 hertz, you know, processing syllables. Now, um, recent research has shown, and also uh, delta for prosody, which is you know, the rhythm of your speech. Now, recent research has shown, and this has come out the past two, three years, very new, that basically, as I'm talking to you now, your gamma waves and your theta waves are phase shifting to align with what I'm saying. So like buckets, they're basically like compartments moving to align to basically register what I'm, what I'm saying. And um, so basically you're tracking what I'm saying with theta waves and, and, and gamma waves and, and delta waves. Now the simple um, thing we can extrapolate from that is the reason why you're able to do that is simply because my production end, my motor cortex, my speech centers is actually working at the same frequencies, gamma, and using the same binary patterning to transmit. That's easy, isn't it? Easy thing to, to, to kind of um, to extrapolate. But then we can extrapolate to the entire brain because these gamma waves and theta waves are all over, all over the place. So it really is like a, like a symphony, like, a, like, you know, it's really coordinated, yeah? So just brand, new, brand spanking new research. And we can suspect that even lower frequencies do have this doubling pattern because of music, okay, back to music, called lower frequencies now. So it's very elegant, isn't it? From entire sentences, long sentences, right down to the micro features of speech, there's a doubling pattern behind it. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Like, it's fractal, yes? It's completely, uh, and right down to the uh, frequency analysis of your auditory cortex, there's also a doubling in frequency, the frequency bands. We analyze, uh, you know, the actual frequency, uh, you know, spectral analysis of m my speech sounds. There's also another doubling pattern. So it's very elegant. So this doubling pattern is everywhere. Um, okay, uh, when we compartmentalize time, this is the reason why, why binary trees can represent time. Okay, and it's because if we compartmentalize time, okay, say gamma waves, so it's pulsed. It's basically, you know, you basically got a time slot, then you got another time slot. Now, these, now how do you represent time then? With these recurrent, recurrent loops. It means that basically if I've got a certain pattern in this time slot here, okay, then it's pulsed. Then I arrive at t plus one, the next pulse, if I have a loop, there's a delay when that signal comes back to the original place, which means when I take, go to t plus one, what has been looped back is basically the signal at t minus one. So basically, at each time slot, you're registering what's happened now, but also happened before at the last time slot because of the loop, yeah? So that's a very simple way where basically each of those um, looping backs is actually a binary tree because you're basically compositing t, t and t minus one. So that's two time steps. And it's thing called, there's a thing called spike time dependent plasticity, where basically the interval, the opportunity for forming a synapse, is when one cell is active and then you have to basically make strength from the synapse um, to that cell is actually 25 milliseconds, which is roughly, uh, you know, one gamma wave. So it kind of fits together, doesn't it? This kind of a way of looking at things. Um, we, could, we could go on, um, you know, basically how brains come to being is basically also binary. We'll talk about this a lot more later in the genomic section of the talk. And uh, also, uh, when, a when axons branch, it's always binary. When, you know, in the dendrites, they branch, it's always binary branching. But you can see this binary pattern is absolutely everywhere in how we represent space, time, music, and, and you know, everything, basically. So um, brain waves, uh, the structure of the brain, we'll go into this later on, and uh, actual, the actual neuron branchings. So, um, so already, we've gone somewhere, haven't we? So we've got this binary language, we've all already gotten somewhere because the same language I'm using to describe DNA and genomes, binary trees, is exactly the same language I can use to describe the brain and the mind. So suddenly this idea of unifying genomics and, and brain and mind doesn't sound so outlandish because we've, we've posed the problem in the same formalism, the same language. So we've gotten somewhere, we've got basically gotten to our first step to this humongous uh, goal of um, trying to answer to the biggest scientific questions in the world. <coughs> but we're going to go all the way before the evening's out. We're going to go all the way and show you basically it really is, uh, it connects, it really does. Uh <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you that funny story of why I'm in the book later, in, during the break, I mean, I told it, uh, when the camera's off because it's quite, uh, quite naughty. And, uh, 
<laughs> so um, just before we take a break, uh, just basically, very importantly, um, show how the brain is one hierarchy. Now, we've expressed all these aspects of the, the mind in terms of language, binary tree, spatial maps, you know, how it represent room, how it represent space, and how it represent language. Okay, language is ubiquitous. Language is a universal representer, isn't it, in terms of binary trees. We've also shown how, which I'll show a bit more later on, how binary trees also inherent in brain structure. Okay. Um, now, because um, we've got everything in the same language, all these aspects of the brain, neurophysiology, and also aspects of the mind, because we, we've got in the same language, we can click together all these separate pieces into one structure. It means, basically, because we've got binary trees representing all these separate modalities, all these separate aspects of the brain and mind, because it's in the same language of binary trees and it's inherently hierarchical, I say to you, I can snap together all these pieces and make one great big classification binary tree of your entire brain and mind. It's actually one structure. But you know it's one structure, don't you? Because you know you are somehow oneness. You somehow, things you think about, there's, there's a kind of unity in your brain that's to do with you, your identity, isn't it? You know it, you know it. I'm gonna show you the exact structure of this identity now in terms of, you know, in terms of neurosubstrates. <coughs> so we have this basic brain hierarchy like we, we went through earlier. Now, um, <coughs> there's a very specific projection pattern as we go up and down the hierarchy. So as we go from the primary cortex, the primary um, sensory cortices, as we go up, there's a very specific pattern to the actual where the layers of the cortex project to and from. So in, in this diagram here, we've got the primary sensory cortex, which could be visual, you know, eyes or ears or joints or whatever. And there's a specific, now the, 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 each column is arranged in six layers. As we go up from the primary sensory area to secondary, tertiary sensory areas, it always projects from, it go, the input will go into layer four, okay, then the signal goes up, and then it goes from two back to layer four. And that's a bottom-up projection pattern. So you actually go up the hierarchy, there's a very specific way of projecting. And as you go down, there's feedback signals, that the feedback signals always come from layer five to layer one, layer five to layer one, you can see that. And there's a kind of mirror pattern in the, in the motor cortex. As I go down the hierarchy, I'm, I'm branching forwards now. Then I go from, so, so going forwards now is, is five to one, five to one. It's kind of the mirror image of sensing. So it's basically, you know, going back backwards in time. And the feedback is now from two to four. So, so basically, as I do things forward in time, then the feedback is the opposite. Okay, so, so it's very, it's just to cut a long story short, it's very precise. It's very ordered as we go up and down the hierarchy, top down, bottom up. <coughs> So basically, if that is your uh, primary motor cortex and that's your uh, primary sensory cortex, then basically, as you go up and down the hierarchy, the, the hierarchies connect up through these, um, what's called longitudinal fasciculi. So the back part of your brain is mainly to do with sensing and the front part is to do with doing, okay? Now, so these longitudinal fasciculi connect the back sensing part to the doing part of your brain. Now, um, you've probably read, you know, women's corpus callosums cl connecting the right and left are actually thicker than men's. So by that reasoning, women are more intuitive. You know, the feeling side connects to the rational side. You know, a zillion new age self-help books have been based on that, you know, fact. It is a fact, I mean, you know, statistically. Now, what's also controversial and, and quite newer is basically men, the front and the back are more connected than women. So I don't, I don't want to start any controversy because we've got quite equal balance of men and women here. So, <laughs> so it just means that you know there are kind of specialisations in, in between the sexes. So, um, but it's interesting, isn't it? It's fascinating. Um, so statistically, that that is the case. Anyway, the, these front and, and back connections, um, basically, they, they connect in a very precise way. So basically, the same level of the hierarchy will connect to the, the roughly the same level of the hierarchy. So it's very precise, yeah. And, um, okay, so, so basically top-down, bottom-up, hierarchical arrangement. Now, I'm going to talk about um, the emotion centers very quickly. Now, uh, basically, um, the hypothalamus is, is what makes you, your brain tick. It's the most important part of your brain. Basically, it's where your drives come from. It's, where, it's the most important, it's where all your desires come from, basically, the wellspring of desire. And the other sections of the emotion center are your amygdala, the red bit here, and also your orbital frontal cortex, and that's to do with emotions, okay. Now, it's also hierarchical because evolutionarily, the hypothalamus is very ancient, then amygdala, then orbital frontal cortex. But also what it represents is also hierarchical. It's basically nested. So say food, okay, food and sex, most uh, you know, primal things, um, it's hierarchical. The hypothalamus will detect hunger in the most basic way. It, it detects glucose levels in your blood. 
And uh, actually, you know, physically detect the glucose in your blood. If you're low glucose, you're hungry. High glucose, you're, you're sated. And it also detects fatty acids. So, okay, now food isn't just <laughs> glucose tablets and, and lard, is it? No, <laughs> that doesn't sound very inspiring. It would if you were starving. Oh my God, glucose tablets and lard, <laughs> great. <laughs> but um, the high performance handles that simple registering of you know, glucose and fatty acids. Now as we get the high amygdala, it's more sophisticated because that takes inputs from your tongue and your taste buds. So now you appreciate salt and sugar and bitter taste. You know, you know what I'm saying? So you've got, you got, you got glucose tablets, you've got lard, and you've got a bit of sugar and you've got a bit of salt now and a bit of vinegar. <laughs> so you become more sophisticated now, yeah? So as you go, <laughs> as we go up the scale, then you know, you basically got uh, oh, you know, fancy restaurants and fancy tastes and you know, all kinds of fancy stuff, you know, dim sum and French cuisine, all that kind of fancy stuff. You get the, you get the picture, it's hierarchical and uh, simple to complex. Now sex, hypothalamus deals with basic orgasm with yourself or you know, with, with anything. Okay, orgasm, hypothalamus, okay. Now, the amygdala, you become more discerning now because you've got a gender preference, <laughs> okay? So you become more sophisticated. So not just, you don't just want to have orgasm with anything, you know, a bit of furniture yourself, you want to have it with someone. <laughs> and you want to have you know, orgasm with someone of a particular sex. So you become more discerning, okay? And um, as we go up the hierarchy, <laughs> I mean, so, so in amygdala, I mean, you know, mice and rats, uh, all sexual behavior is driven by pheromones. So basically, you, you don't see the sex of a rat, lady rat or Mr. Rat, you smell it. And that's handled by the amygdala, so that's sexual differentiation. And as you go further up the hierarchy, orbital frontal cortex, you've got more complex stuff like, um, you know, 0 0.7 ratios and, you know, kind of you know, smooth, you know, kind of basic, still quite basic, but, but more sophisticated now. And as you get further up the hierarchy, you talk about things like personality, is she kind? Is he, has he got a sense of humor? <laughs> you get the picture, yeah? So you get basically got this hierarchy in the emotion centers from basic to sophisticated. Now we're gonna basically talk about those, those centers earlier on, the stratum and cerebellum. Okay, the stratum and cerebellum, which we talked about earlier on, basically, um, okay, we'll skip through a lot of this. Basically, they, they both work with the, the frontal cortex. And what they do is they form closed loops with the frontal cortex. And uh, these closed loops basically represent time. They basically automatize behavior. And the stratum and cerebellum both automatize behavior and, and involved in sequential learning. When you learn to play a sequence, a musical sequence or behavior using a cerebellum and stratum. Now what's um, recently in the past 10, 15 years is basically what's been found is that the stratum and cerebellum also work with the emotion centers. So all the emotion centers, amygdala, hypothalamus and orthofrontal cortex also are automatized with the stratum and cerebellum. And uh, okay, there's, there's loads more, but interesting finding from a few years back from Japan is that we can now work out why there are these two complementary structures to do with automatization. And they're really important, they're really, really important. It's because they found that the, 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 the recursive loop of the cerebellum ends up in layer four, and the recursive loop of the stratum ends up in layer one. Back to our diagrams earlier, do you remember, do you remember the top-down pattern was layer five to layer one, and the bottom-up pattern was basically, you know, you know, projecting to layer four. What it means is that from this data, that stratum projects to the, 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 the top-down pattern of layer one and the cerebellum to the bottom-up, it means that basically they're, they're automatizing two separate components. Basically, when you do something from the top, your emotion centers, or from the language centers, okay, abstract, you send signals top-down, okay, and that's basically automatized by the striatum because it's automatizing layer one, friction two layer one. Now, say, say I want to change a gear on a car when you're learning how to drive, you have to think about it. And you basically send the signals top down. I want to move the gear stick where, where, wherever. And then, but then there's bottom up feedback. As you move the gear stick, there's a sensation of the gear stick moving. That's bottom up. The simple idea is basically the striatum is automatizing the top down signal and the um, cerebellum is automatizing the bottom up. It means that um, you can send a sequence of movements, you know, playing a guitar, piano, top down, and then uh, a, whole, a whole complex sequence, but then the stratum will learn all the top down signals. You see? So basically, th then it comes to a point, and also as it sends out the top down signals, it also the cerebellum learns the bottom up signals. It means you've got a self contained loop. It means all I have to do is send up the first signal to get the loop going, then it's automatically plays out, plays out on its own. You see, it's, it's very, you know, so basically I don't have to think about changing the gear stick 
I just send a signal, you know, you're, you're, on, a, you're, on, a, you're on a kind of busy junction on a hill, you can change the gear about six times, can't you, in a few seconds, you know, in a busy intersection. When you, when you first learn how to drive a car, it takes you ages. You're like, oh, you know, what's it going to do and stuff? But anyway, um, we can take this idea further when we basically now, okay, we're going to go through the entire brain and show the entire brain is actually one automatization hierarchy. So we're basically now going to, Okay, uh, link together all this knowledge we've gone through about hierarchical representations in the brain. So, so okay, we had these hypothalamus and uh, the, uh, the amygdala and uh, all the frontal cortex. And basically what we've done now is basically we have added the, um, these are the stratal elements. So we talked about stratum. These are just fancy names for the stratal aspects of these emotion centers. Now, we, we, these are dopamine neurons. We haven't talk, really talked about dopamine neurons, but there's, these are the, the, the chemical of addiction, basically. What's, what makes these stratum work? But if we, we'll, we'll kind of cut it out just to get onto the genome stuff. <laughs> okay, but it's interesting. I mean, dopamine, without dopamine, you get Parkinson's disease. Without dopamine, you know, and drugs that boost dopamine and VTA, ventral tegmental area, are all addictive. So, obviously, it kind of makes it tick. It's, it's interesting. Anyway, um, the same thing we've done here with the emotion centers, we can do with the cognitive centers and the anterior cingulate cortex, the polar frontal cortex, and what's called the uh, area 46 dorsal, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So we're going to lower down hierarchy to do with thinking and cognition. So, but the emotion centers feed into the an anterior cingulate cortex, that uh, feeds in, into the next layer of the hierarchy. And then the um, area 46 feeds into the motor cortex, which is the, um, f again, it's hierarchy, pre-supplementary motor area, supplementary motor area, and you've got your primary motor cortex, and they're off, off to your arms and legs, they're moving arms and legs about. So, it's, so basically, you can connect up these three diagrams with their bits of stratum and dopamine neurons, and make it into one big hierarchy from the hypothalamus. Okay, now the next step is we add in, voila, cerebellum. <laughs> so basically, you've got your top-down automatization with the stratum, now I've added in the, the bottom-up automatization with the cerebellum. And now, do you remember those um, frontal posterior, you know, kind of thicker in men versus women connections from the front and back? Okay, we're going to add those in the diagram now. So basically, voila, that's your back sensory cortices. And this, this is the wiring pattern of where it goes into the, the orange sections, into the cerebellum, also the frontal cortex. So it's, it's a, it, this diagram is actually a simplification, <laughs> okay? It's actually lots of caveats and, and qualifications, but it's actually a simplification just to show that you can organize the brain in terms of one top-down hierarchy. Now, okay, some qualifications are that some of the links will jump, jump several stages and connections from the amygdala actually end up in the primary visual cortex. But you get the basic gist. This overall design is actually very, very uh, structured about how, you, how your brain is organized. And all the qualifications are understood in terms of this hierarchy. So basically it means, basically, okay, basically from the hypothalamus and all these, your kind of frontal a uh, hierarchy to do with doing, uh, w working with your sensory uh, hierarchy of sensing, interacting with the automatization hierarchies of the cerebellum and, um, and, and striatum. It means that you have one continuous automatization hierarchy from the hypothalamus right down to the primary motor cortex. It means I detect hunger, or I detect first, I detect whatever, then autom you can automatize the entire chain of behavior right from the initial hypothalamus, I want this, automatically un unfolds an entire chain of behavior. I'm thirsty, I go to the fridge, I don't want to drink tap water, I want a fizzy drink, I get into the car, I need to get some money from a bank, complex behavior, I go to 7-Eleven, I guess, you know, do you, do you see what I mean? But it's all automatized, I don't think about driving, I don't think about going to the bank, I don't think about paying the cashier. But you see the power of this hierarchy, and then you, you, then you see the kind of relevance of the cerebellum and the, and the stratum. And then most of the things you do in your life are automatized by the atom and cerebellum. So, I mean, okay, we've really gotten somewhere. Okay, this is relevant because the genome is also organized as a, as in a hierarchical way. So, so we've basically talked about the brain. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to totally relate everything we talked about to the genome and show there's an absolute perfect correspondence between the two. Just skim over quickly, how does the brain, brain work? What's the actual process of the brain? Okay, and if you've got a fractal brain theory that's completely self-similar and completely fractal, the, there's, a, there's a way of looking at the brain, how it works, which is also completely fractal. Okay, this is, this is very innovative. If you've got a single unifying language and you've got a single unifying structure, th th then that's a stepping stone for actually showing that there's actually one unifying process for the brain and mind. Okay, so what is that process? And um, then we'll show that process extends the DNA and genome.
Okay, so this is huge. Okay, so everything you heard so far is just the platform for, for the, ne the next bit. Now, now, the process of the brain I'm, I'm going to explain is basically it's completely symmetrical, it's completely self similar. So, as I reason for a neuron, I can reason for my complex behavior. As I reason for the hypothalamus trickling down all the behavior down the hierarchy and all the you know, sensory cortices sending to the hippocampus and hypothalamus, that's working like a neuron. But as a reason for complex behavior, all the behaviors that emanate, emanated today to get here, get, get on the, you know, get on the coach, get, get here, book the room and stuff, and all these things I do, these are emanations. And as a reason for a neuron, I can reason for an entire life. Okay, and I can actually reason from the actual birth of my life, from a fertilized egg, right to the process of that fertilized egg make, making my body. And then what I'm doing now is I'm emanating behaviors, the things I'm saying, moving my arm, these are emanations. That's actually one continuous emanation from a fertilized egg, and one single concept, concept ex explains all of it. It also extrapolates to the universe. <laughs> okay, this is huge. Okay, this is absolutely uh, astoundingly massive. Okay, okay. So what is that process? It's basically we're back to our tree. It's basically a process of emanation from a point, emanating, emanating out, and like but like the roots of the tree, emanating backwards from a point in the future. So the roots and the uh, roots and the leaves that intersect. So it's a slight different from a tree, basically emanating and backward aggregating and intersect like a neuron, dendrites flowing in and, and signals flowing out. Now, if there's a one idea in artificial intelligence that recurs again and again, that's fundamental, is this idea of forward search from a, a start, uh, it's basically tree search, you're searching tree space in a combinatorial space. And uh, an idea of you searching forwards from the start point, which is your axioms, and you're searching backwards from your goal point. But this idea, any you know, say the most used AI textbook, which is Peter Norvig and, and Stuart Russell's AI modern approach, or, or any AI textbook, the first few chapters will basically introduce this tree search and it's basically emanating outwards into possibility space and going backwards. Now, you, you know about chess algorithms, basically you've got your chess moves. So all the possibilities of chess moves exploding out into exponential space. But then you have all the end games going backwards and then you, you make the two connect. So you search forwards and you search backwards and then you make the two connect. This idea occurs again and again. So the most used AI textbook is a telephone directory of a book. It keeps coming up again and again and again, the idea. It's just fundamental. So in, in logic, the idea of forward chaining logic search and then backward chaining from your axioms you want to prove. It's, it's the same idea. Now, it's, it's not quite feedback. It's, it's forward emanating and basically intersecting. And also situational calculus. The robot needs to get there. This is the robot where the robot is here. You emanate all the things that the robot can do. And then all the things the robot can do to get to where it is. And, the, and when it meets, that's the path, yeah? That's the, that's, that's the answer. So it's absolutely fundamental. But it's the same. It's the roots of a tree and the branches of, the, of a tree. So that's, uh, I, I say this is what, we, this is what we, uh, our brains are doing. So this is what neurons are doing. This is what your brain's doing. Completely symmetrical, completely fractal. So how do you explain it? Well, we know that what, what your neurons are doing is fundamentally sensing in a way, the dendrites are sensing information. And when it's outputting information, that's what it's doing, isn't it? And also, um, OK, I'll jump. Things link up in the brain. So you know, synapses link up on a structure of dendrite. Dendrites link up on a neuron body. The neurons link up together. They you know that ideas link up. And they link up in space, and they chain up in time. And also, ideas compete, and then neurons compete, and then synapses compete, and then perceptions compete. Now, the, the most important concept for explaining disunification is basically the idea that sensing and doing, they basically connect up to form mappings. So the sensing end connects up with the doing end that forms a mapping. Well, a mapping is one of the most fundamental concepts there is. It's so fundamental, you don't even think of it as a concept because it's basically it's so fundamental. Um, ma mathematical formulas, when you say y equals fx, that's a mapping. You're mapping values of x to values of y. That's, that's a mapping, okay? Um, logical implications, a mapping, conditional probability, you know, all these transformations, that's all mapping. And uh, a logic gate, or, and, not, is a mapping. Logic circuits, sequential circuits, combinatorial circuits, an entire microchip, an entire computer, what it does is mappings in time. And also, um, phylogenesis, uh, evolution is a mapping. Basically, you're mapping genes, one set of genes, another set of genes, basically transform transformative mappings. We can go on and on and on, and, and in the brain, this idea of the roots, you know, inflow, outflow, what it's doing is mapping. It's mapping a set of inputs to, to a set of outputs. So absolutely fundamental. Now, how do we use that to explain how this, this unifying process? Okay, just skip a couple of slides. Okay, look, we need to unify 
these four processes. We think they are the same process. <coughs> the, the, the brain comes to being through neurogenesis, so cells divide into two, into four, into eight, into 16. Okay, that's one process, neurogenesis. Your, how your brain comes to being, how neurons are produced. And then the, 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 the neurons connect up, laterally connect. Okay, that, okay, most of the wires in your brain is do lateral connection. That's another process. And then these uh, connections make patterns and then the patterns are chained in time. This is really important. That's what cerebellum and stratum does. And that's another process, yeah? And then, um, okay, this is one aspect of the brain where artificial intelligence and also uh, philosophers and also people in cognitive science get it right, is that the most creative algorithm in, on the planet is called evolution. Okay, it's actually okay, it's incomplete theory. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a creationist, but there's ways of looking at evolution, which is far more interesting than the standard model now. Okay, but it's really interesting. It's because it's really creative. When they say MEMS, neural Darwinism, genetic algorithms to say that evolution is going on in the brain, they're absolutely right. And you know for a fact, you know, I've got two little girls and basically babbling, babies babbling, that's evolution. And the sounds suddenly mold to become the accent and the language of the parent, that's evolution. You actually see it at work. You know, flailing limbs become coordinated behavior. That's evolution, yeah? So anyway, um, so basically that's going on in the brain at all levels, all fractal scales. Now we think all these four processes are the same process. And this is absolutely very powerful because then we, we can show this happening in genes as well. <coughs> A kind of diagram to show. Okay, so cell division, okay, is one process. And, and going laterally across, you, you can imagine kind of opening up directories going across, it's like connecting and opening up that directories and going into space across. Now in time, it's like, you know, back to our game trees, games of chess, this is the idea of exploring forwards into space in time. It could be driving a car, e each intersection, you make left turn, right turn, forwards or whatever. Some intersections are more complex, you know, but you never get more than, say, six or seven a year. And, and each, uh, you make a bunch of choices and the choices you make determine where you're gonna end up, basically, even on the motorway or, or you know, place you wanna go to. And, uh, so, um, and then another branching process, diverging branching process, is the process of evolution. So that actually, that's a proper evolution as in the tree of life. But can you see, they're all trees, and they all actually branch out. So we think that all these four processes are actually the same process, which correspond to you know, neurogenesis laterally connecting sideways, tempor temporarily chaining, and then altering those evolutionary aspects. And it's because, if we go back to our binary trees, if we have an end node, and we want to make two nodes from that, the process of neurogenesis is actually can be expressed as a mapping. It just means I'm at n node, there's no node there, I map to another two nodes basically, so it's a mapping. It's called a generative mapping, okay? And uh, as I go across in space, I uh, a kind of axon linking up two neurons or two, you know, a fiber bundle linking up two areas of the cortex. A pattern A will map to pattern B, and that's also a mapping. As I go across, as I go across, I'm actually exp exploring sideways in the combinatorial space. And as I go forwards in time, again, it's a mapping. Uh, this is the most you know, normal kind of mapping that we do. I'm at a traffic light, red light, stop. Green light, mapping, you know, step on the gas, yeah? So these are mappings, and these are fundamental. So, you know, neurogenesis mapping, going sideways is mapping, and, um, and going um, forwards in time is also mapping. But then, when we do evolution with genes, we flip a gene, a point mutation, that's also a mapping. It's a transformative mapping. Now, what all these mappings are doing, they're exploring in the combinatorial space because if we map into uh, neurogenesis, these are actually combinations. You see, 0, 1, 0, 1, each of these is a combination of a path down this, this combinatorial space. So as I go forwards in my neurogenesis, creating these cells going forwards, I'm actually mapping, exploring into combinatorial space. See, so each of these are combinations, four different combinations. As I go, keep going, I'm actually exploring the combinations. And as I go sideways, I'm also exploring in the combinatorial space. I can't create all the spatial patterns, and I select certain ones to strengthen. And as I go forwards in time, I can't do all the possible things I can do. I do certain things that lead to rewards and avoid certain things that lead to, lead to pain. And as I uh, evolve things um, evolutionarily, I'm also mapping. It means that all these um, four processes are all mapping into, co in com into combinatorial space and exploring into combinatorial space. Now, if I had to imagine ev evolution as an algorithm, well, basically, the people at, like, at the Santa Fe Institute, <laughs> will, will, if we had to describe evolution as an algorithm, then the algorithm is differentiate. 
select amplify. That's the algorithm evolution. So you differentiate into different species or diff the gene pool is you know, a variation in the gene pool. A certain will be selected over others, fitter specimens, slight fitter, slight advantage. And those are amplified, i.e. They, they breed more. But also, if I go back, temporal chaining, I can't s strengthen all the uh, behaviors, but I don't mean consolidate those behaviors, which lead to reward. So again, I differentiate in all the possible things I can do, all the baby babblings sounds, but certain ones are consolidated, are selected over others, and they're consolidated and strengthened and amplified. But if I go back, lateral connecting, I, I can't make all the connections, make all the spatial patterns, but I select those ones which may match up again with you know, kind of rewards and, and kind of patterns which are useful. And then again, with um, neurogenesis, I, I'm diverging out into combinatorial space, but I'm selecting certain ones that, that are then strengthened with neural growth factor or trophic growth factor, and those cells become strong and the other ones die, okay, so you see. But going forwards again, can you see that, that, that process of exploring into combinatorial space with neurogenesis and selecting certain ones to survive <coughs> creates the level for the next stage whereby you laterally connect up the ones that survive and are selected to make spatial patterns, which then sets up conditions for the next stage, which means you can chain those spatial patterns in time to make spatial temporal patterns, which then sets up conditions for the next stage whereby you mutate those spatial temporal representations, i.e. the baby babbling trying to utter a word becomes approximately better and better. But it basically means that you've got the same algorithm working in slightly different modes. You can see that. It's basically mapping in combinatorial space to explore combinatorial space in terms of building structures and then linking up those structures spatially and then chain those structures in time and then exploring using the mutational aspect. But can you see it's actually one algorithm? Now this one algorithm means I explore forwards into space. I, I emanate forwards into space in terms of generating kind of neurons or cells and linking them up into combinatorial code spatially, then linking up in time, then mutating them. I'm exploring outwards, okay, back, to those, back to those trees again. I'm going forwards. But can you see it's actually one emanation? And one level sets up the conditions for the next level, for the next level, it's actually one algorithm. But, but we need a complementary algorithm to then uh, basically um, select. And, and the answer is basically that there's a tree I, I, won't, I won't go into simulation, computer simulation, just to save time. There's a backward emanating tree, which basically emanates backwards from the goals, and then you backward chain from the goals, you know, so certain things become salient and rewarded, and then the forward tree intersects that tree. Can you see? But we just, just, just take that backward tree emanating fractally back to dendrites and, and, you know, and also kind of the, the root systems. So you can see kind of like a, a kind of symmetry of process between you know, neurogenesis laterally connecting, chaining in time, and also mutating those ideas. Now we're going to apply what we just talked about to genes. And it's actually perfect correspondence to genes. Now this is the, <laughs> the actual meat of the talk. Okay. <laughs> so okay, this, is, this is the brand new stuff. It's actually so new. It's, uh, I think it's, 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 it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's powerful stuff. And really, it's going to turn, um, you know, I've got, I've got Christoph Koch in my, my head. And uh, basically, <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, there's a specific challenge in science yeah, today. Right. <laughs> no, no, there's a, it's huge, you know, genomics and mind-brain is one answer, but there's actually a specific challenge which I've been gearing up to basically, you know, to, to answer. So, okay, now, okay, so, so here's the, the genome part. <clears throat> so, okay, so this is what we explain, what we explain, let's go through this. Like, this, uh, this, uh, this is how we explain how, how the genome works. This, this is the unknown, okay. So the huge unknown. Now, the fractal brain theory fills in a kind of, um, a, a kind of unknown, but, but this is making its way in the world now. It's, it's gaining adherence every day. So fractal brain theory, it, it's, it's powerful. I think it's right. I think it's actually, you know, it's not just, uh, it's actually a very powerful theory. It's actually expanding and growing. And um, okay, so what, what we do know is, uh, what we've talked about so far is this section, all this section here, that you can take components of the brain and then show how the, the fractal brain theory shows it is one kind of emanation from a point and how there's commonalities, symmetries of structure and symmetries of process, and also that it's hierarchical, that's one hierarchy. So basically, that's what we've been talking about. Now, okay, to, to, to fill in this bit here, this is stuff we're gonna talk about next, which is basically that details of genomics and DNA function. This is new stuff, this is completely new. It's, it's only been discovered in the past five years by you know, very clever people working in genomics. And, uh, but there's amazing correspondence between the genome and the details of brains. I, it is incredible. I mean, there's amazing correspondence between the findings in genomics and how neurons work. Okay, so we're going to go through this in a minute and show the, the correspondence. Okay, details of genomics and DNA. Okay, that's, that's what I'm going to explain in a minute. 
And uh, we have a sort of a rough idea what DNA does. DNA has to create a body. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely a miracle. A fertilized egg, you know, um, kind of, you know, a three billion base pairs somehow encodes an entire body, human, human life, a human, all these predispositions. It's incredible, it's amazing. It's, a, it's data decompression, basically, and it's absolutely astounding. And uh, we know, roughly know how it does it. It does it through cell division. One cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, and all the cells in your body. And, and it also has to define specialized cells. At the end of the division, a liver cell has to be told what to do, what enzymes to produce, etc. Skin cells have to produce certain enzymes and structural proteins. You can see at the end, the DNA then functions like a little onboard computer. So it makes the body, but then it continues, continues working as a kind of onboard computer to tell, you know, liver cell, oh, you al detect alcohol in the bloodstream, therefore you, you synthesize the enzyme to break down the alcohol. So it's like a little like a reflex mechanism, yeah? Like, like a little simple computer. Yeah. Then explain a basic correspondence between these two areas. So we know roughly what, what's going on, what the genome is doing, and roughly how it's doing it. And with the fr fractal brain theory, we, we can show of this uh, you know, single emanating process. And we think that basically by showing a correspondence here and here, we can use the brain theory to completely fill in this missing area. And then we can do the same with the fractal brain theory and show that this actually works exactly like a miniature fractal brain. It's absolutely astounding, absolutely astounding <laughs> claim, which means that there's a perfect symmetry between workings of the genome and the entire brain, and which means that I can join these two diagrams end to end. It's because the genome produces the body and brain, but then that, that brain works like a big genome. <laughs> so the genome is like a little fractal brain that produces a big brain that works like a big genome because it's complete fractal. Okay, so this is what we're going to uh, do now. Okay, now um, how is a gene like a neuron? Okay, how is it? How is a gene like a neuron? This is uh, not obvious. Okay, so I'm going to use a prop. I thought I was going to do loads of diagrams, but um, I'm going to use a prop. That's that, that's like length of DNA. And there's my gene. It's right here. Okay, so genes produce. RNA. So basically, DNA produces RNA. And then, oh, okay, actually, this is literally straight, to, straight to your question. So basically, how is, how is that gene like a neuron? It's because the output side is that it produces RNA. And the RNA is transcribed from the DNA, and a DNA RNA pattern corresponds to the DNA pattern. Now, new findings in the past five years shows that RNA can actually directly have an effect, can do things. Because the, the kind of the central orthodoxy, the central dogma, they called it, from, from Crick and Watson, was that the, the, how it worked, they supposed, was that RNA left, left the nucleus and then entered ribosomes and became proteins. And then the protein could come back to influence the, the, the nucleus. That does the central dogma. But they know now that RNA can directly do things. So things like microRNAs and eRNAs and link RNAs and actually directly are active and functional. So the RNAs can actually do things now without any next step. Um, so that's, that's like, if that's a neuron, and that's, that's gene, that's like the output side, it's outputting RNA, which can become structural proteins or enzymes, or directly activate other bits of genes, okay? So that's, a, that's RNA. Now, what are the inputs? Is that, okay, we have a gene, so upstream, you have promoters, and there's the lengths of DNA, which take transcription factors. And uh, you have between 1 and 15, but normally it's about 2 and 4, maybe 5, two, between 2 and 5 um, kind of uh, promoter regions that then bind transcription factors. And the transcription factors are codes. They're basically chemicals, they're proteins, there's about 3,000 of them. And basically the code will activate those, those sites. And with the right code, the gene will activate. So the pr promoters are near the gene with the right code that will prime it to activate. Now, there's also what's called enhancers. So the enhancers are further away. And it's also like a promoter. So it's basically, it also has binding sites for um, uh, these uh, transcription factors. Now, um, the enhancers can be a long way away. But when it binds a certain combination of transcription factors, it will touch the promoter and the gene. And then transcription starts. So it sends out RNA. OK? Now, um, one gene can actually have many enhancers. So I can have an enhancer here, an enhancer here, and they can each bind a certain combination of transcription factors, and all those separate enhancers can activate that gene. Can you see? Harmonic distances? Oh, it, it's not harmonic distance. The actual, the actual chromatin structure is actually configured actively. So actually the, okay, I'll go through this in a minute. Sometimes the actual uh, DNA touches, but then it's also a transmission network. The actual molecules diffuse from point to point. Now it's fascinating because 
the, um, the transcription factors make a combinatorial code. If I have the right key, the right code, then I can prime the promoters, the, the working of the gene. So there's a combinatorial code, which means and. If I, this transcription factor and that one and that one activate the gene or repress it. Now, the enhancers are also like a combinatorial code. But because many enhancers can actually activate that same gene, that means it's like logical or. So this enhancer or that enhancer or that enhancer can activate my gene. So basically, and then the, you get, you've got knots, so you've got repressors. So a certain combination of transcription factors will repress that gene. So basically, you have inputs like den dendrites to a neuron, but with those uh, free conditions, you've got and logic, you've got or logic, and you've got not logic, which is basically the building blocks of all computation. Okay? So, so already, you know, you see genes are really powerful. It needs some new findings, very, very new. And uh, so that's how a gene is like a neuron. Now, okay, this is really exciting new research. Now, now how, how is the gene, how is this arranged? Okay, this is my crappy headphones, uh, tangled mess. But the way DNA is arranged in the nucleus is really organized. And this is brand new. It's organized as a fractal globule. Now, this is not me uh, calling it a fractal globule. It's what they call, as a, the main researchers actually work on this, they call it a fractal globule. Why is it a fractal globule? Because it's completely untangled. It's absolutely a miracle. It's a miracle. Um, basically, it's fractal because it's completely untangled and it basically it works like a Pinot curve. Can you see, this is a fractal curve. Can you see, it? it's basically it's a fractal algorithm and it creates a curve. I can keep taking this algorithm to infinity, but can you see, it's actually one line. Can you see, that's one line. So that doesn't change. It means the algorithm, that's still one line. It's still one continuous curve, yeah? I can take that to infinity. This, this actually explains why two meters of DNA cram into your nucleus. It's because it's a fractal curve. So the fractal globule is essentially a fractal curve fitted on a spherical form. It means, can you see, this, this, um, this, this line, which could be infinite, it could be two meters in the DNA, can you see, it's completely unknotted. At no point does it intersect itself. So I can take any, any point of this curve, I can pull it out. Because it's not knotted, it won't catch. What they've found now is that basically the... Um, DNA is organized as a fractal globule. So it's organized like a Pinot curve. And that's astounding because it means that I can take any strand, I can pull it all the way out, I can push it back in again, and it's completely unknotted. So that's a recent finding from literally less than five years, uh, about four or five years, more confirmation coming in every, 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 uh, every, every year. Well, and what's new, what's new is basically that the, the, the strands, they're configured in a certain way, and certain cells have a specific configuration. It's based on proteins, special link proteins. Yeah, this is amazing, absolutely astounding. It's like a universe of complexity inside each nucleus, and it's absolutely mind-blowing, you know, really. Okay, so fractal globule is basically an untangled, you know, like length of DNA, and uh, it's basically, if you imagine, okay, that's the nucleus, that's where the, all the DNA is, okay, that's, that's the nucleus. And uh, so the two meters of DNA is in that area there. Now how it's organized is basically, what, what another recent finding is chromosomal territories. So each chromosome is like one molecule, one big molecule of DNA. And, and any, okay, you've got, you've got 23 pairs of, of chromosomes, so those are numbers marked in of different chromosomal territories. And uh, obviously the other side has the uh, other complementary numbers. Now. Um, Basically, um, the fractal globules basically is one fractal globule for each chromosome because each one's a separate molecule, yeah? And so basically, that's the nucleus. What they worked out basically is that the fractal globules stick onto the walls of the nucleus, but the DNA that's not used, that's inactivated, uh, you know, um, epigenetically, it's stuck to the walls. But what's facing inwards, the center, is the DNA you want to pull out. So basically, um, you, you have these strands that's stuck to the walls, but then the fractal globule, you pull out these strands and they meet in the center. Now, this diagram doesn't do it justice. Obviously, it's really complex. They've got these zillions of strands of DNA pulled out, and the strands configure in a certain way, so certain enhancers touch other promoters. And certain cell types will have a specific configuration of physical uh, strands of DNA will be configured in a certain way to work in a certain way. Absolutely astounding. This is very new, cutting edge, absolutely, of uh, genetics. And uh, so what it means is that in the center of the nucleus, you have basically, if it, the, the genes are on these strands of DNA, are like neurons, then in the center of the nucleus, you have basically a transmission network. So you have the chromosomal domains with all these strands of DNA meeting in the center, you know, pr producing transcription factors and kind of uh, you know, micro RNAs and all these RNAs which do stuff directly, and then transcription factors which are turns the proteins which come back to activate genes. 
basically what you have in the center is basically a, a regulatory network. So in the brain, you have neurons directly connected to axons and dendrites, ma making a point-to-point -point network. But what you have here is a transmission network, and also a network involving physical contact between promoters and enhancers. But it's still a network, can you see? So signals get from A to B, like with axons and dendrites. So it's a, it's a complete network inside a, a nucleus, and it's very precisely configured. OK, so, so basically we have a network as a transmission network, and some of the uh, nodes are like transactivation, and some are transrepression, to d corresponding with excitatory and inhibitory neurons and link connections. And then the links are actually adjustable. They're adjustable hereditarily, i.e. you're going to have a gene regulation network based on your parents, but also new epigenetic genetic findings show that you can actually alter it in, in your lifetime. OK, so cutting edge, absolutely, absolutely cutting edge. Now, OK, now we also, we also know that the gene regulatory networks, this kind of network of all, the, all your genes and all your kind of uh, inputs and outputs and transcription factors is organized in a complete hierarchy. So, you know, like, like lower down your motor hierarchy, you've got, you got prime, remember back to the diagram of the brain, you've got the uh, primary motor cortex, which is basically the effector regions of your, you know, your brain. It means your arms and legs move about and you, you know, your mouth moves and you do stuff. Now, the, they actually call them effector genes in the DNA. The effector genes actually produce enzymes and structural proteins. So obviously that's the doing end. Basically, at the end of the day, your DNA has to produce enzymes and structural proteins, doesn't it? That's how you've got, you've got a body, that's how you have metabolism, that's how you have basically life. So that's the kind of business end of your genes. But most of the DNA, okay, 1.5 of your DNA is actually uh, you know, producing proteins and producing enzymes and structural proteins. They used to think that uh, the other 98.1% was junk. That, it's not anymore. No, I don't think anymore. No, no. It, it, there's, there's a raging debate as to how much is used. But we're talking maybe 30, 20%, 30%, 20%, that kind of thing. No one knows, basically. Um, they, they know from a recent study from ENCODE that 80% of the DNA is biologically active. You know, enzymes work on it and it produces RNA, but we don't know how much of that has noise. So basically, it's still a raging debate going on. I would say 30%, there's still a lot of, you know, a lot of DNA still. But anyway, um, so um, basically, uh, okay, if you've got effector genes and effect, effector like uh, primary motor cortex, then what we have is, at the end of the day, you have genes producing enzymes and structural proteins. But then the genes are arranged in what's called gene batteries. So say I want to give a cell dopamine function. Okay, you need to basically, uh, you need a, a whole row of um, specific enzymes to synthesize dopamine because it's synthesized in several steps. And then you also need a, a gene to produce the receptors and reuptake mechanisms. So they actually appear in batteries, the modules. So the modules, you have a dopamine module and an acetylcholine module and every single, you know, kind of met met metabolic network in your body. So it's modular. Th then, then these uh, kind of gene batteries organized in hierarch hierarchically. So, you know, so see, you get a picture, you get, get dopamine works with neurotensin. So you have a, a kind of compound battery, a hierarchy. And as you go up the hierarchy, you have basically uh, genes which can actually trigger the production of an entire part of, a, part of an animal, a leg, an arm. <laughs> so basically, you can see it's hierarchically arranged. At the very top of the hierarchy is that which triggers the process of ontogenesis. I, and it comes from maternal RNA, it comes from the mother. So a uh, kind of signal comes from the mother into the egg, into the fertilized, you know, the sperm mixed egg, and then a signal has to trigger the process by which um, the cascade then starts the body forming. You know, starts all those hox genes, which are higher up the hierarchy, segmenting body parts, and then the body parts grow from those hox areas. And then eventually you've got, you know, dopamine batteries being activated, the muscle ba batteries. Like the top end of the hypothalamus. Exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. So basically, hierarchically, so the, the, the genome is a completely, hi completely hierarchical, complete top down hierarchy. Now, as we discussed earlier, there is a kind of lateral hierarchy, hypothalamus to the primary motor cortex. But what's most important is the temporal hierarchy. Because, um, okay, now we're talking about time. What's happening in time? The fertilized egg in time becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes, that's happening in time. So there's a correspondence with human beings is what we do in time. I, I'm at an intersection, I make a decision to turn left or right. That's happening in time, okay? So um, we're gonna explain the next step, which is basically finding the correspondence between the, how the, the, the brain kind of works and how the DNA makes the body. We have a rough idea because we know it's ontogenesis and this is a, a, a temporal unfolding process. And again, because of, of, it's basically a binary you know, hierarchy from fertilized egg to two to four to 16 to all the cells in your body evolving in time, but it's also a hierarchy. 
And eventually, you know, at the end nodes, you've got specialized cells that are going to activate specific gene batteries, i.e. spatial hierarchies. You see, already there's parallels between the process I explained earlier to do with the brain and also to do with ontogenesis. Now, the, 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 the um, kind of um, analogy is that um, the, the, the way to unify these two concepts is basically what the same language, binary trees and binary hierarchies. Okay, the, the way to, 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 to see it is that basically as I make decisions to go to a certain place, and when I'm in a certain place, I do certain things. Okay, I do uh, certain actions. In the same way, as you go down the kind of ontogenetic hierarchy, a certain cell is in a certain place, context, and it becomes a certain kind of cell. Is that like an analogy? But the difference, okay, in the same way that you have a transmission network versus point-to-point -point network, but they're equivalent. The difference is that the, the um, ontogenesis process can duplicate itself. So, okay, look, I'll give you an analogy to explain the, the subtle difference is that, okay, look, if there's eight sections of wall, okay, I can't make eight copies of myself to paint each, each, each section of wall. So what I have to do is basically I have to paint one section of the wall to another section, and it takes me eight time steps. But the, the, what's going on in DNA, it's that you are duplicating the cells. It's a parallel processing versus sequential processing. But the, the actual theory behind it is actually equivalent. You're doing binary trees and, 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 and sequ sequential breaking down of those binary trees. <coughs> okay, so basically um, we got this kind of correspondence between a kind of, um, you know, how brains work in exploring space and the specialized roles we play in a certain context, physical context, with the uh, neurogenesis process, ontogenesis, cell division process, exploring kind of physical, you know, cell space, and then cells becoming specialized. That's, that's, that's the correspondence, it's analogous here. And, and of course, we're in the same language. It's not just a loose analogy. It's actually in the same formalism. Okay, now, okay, how do we, how does the genome do it? How does the genome track context? Now, when I, my, I've got a head, I've got short-term memory, I've got long-term memory, I can track where I've been. I've done X, Y, Z, you know, in, in time steps. I've done A, B, C, D, I've done X, Y, Z, and I can track what, what's happened in the past. You know, I've turned left, then I've turned right, then I've turned left, then I've turned right. That's allocentric mapping. Basically, that gives me an idea of where I'm now. Okay, so I can track that with short-term memory. What's the mechanism that allows me to track as, I, as the cell becomes two, becomes four, to track those cell context, what's the mechanism? It's epigenetics. Okay, this is what we <laughs> I was going to tell you talk about. Now, now basically epigenetics is a really exciting area. There's, what was, I guess is what people think is classical epigenetics. It's basically the trick. We need basically for a memory to form in, in the cell, okay, and then when the cell divides into two, we need that memory to be duplicated. So obviously the DNA doesn't change, but the, the, the epigenetic pattern does change and it's programmable. But once we have a certain pattern in the cell, when it divides into two, we want that pattern to be duplicated. So, okay, this classical epigenetics, I guess it's a new field. I mean, it's not classical. It means, it means 10 years, uh, you know, what people used to think 10 years ago is epigenetics, but th there's a kind of revised extended version. So classical epigenetics is things like methylation, which means on the uh, cytosine group of DNA, you put a methyl group, okay. So it's actually a chemical mark. It's a methyl ke chemical mark on your DNA. And once you have that, and there's loads, there's zillions, there's millions of chemical, these methyl groups, and, and a specific pattern on DNA. When the cell divides into two, the exact pattern of methylation is duplicated. Okay, so that's uh, epigenetic. Uh, other examples is the chromatin structure. You know, those, those um, you know, DNA is a kind of, a B, um, you know, those, those beads, those structures on what the DNA is bound. It's called chromatin. And you can alter the chromatin structure and there's a thing called deacetylation. You take it with acetyl groups, then the chromatin structure bunches up, becomes heterochromatin, which means you can't access the DNA. And if you reacetyl the, kind of the, de the chromatin, then it loosens up again, you can access it again. And, and again, if the, when a cell divides, that, that pattern of acetylation is duplicated. Okay, that, that's, that's interesting. Now, the really powerful um, epigenetic factor, epigenetic means around the genes. Genes don't change, but what goes around it, methylation, acetylation, does change. The really powerful memory is the pattern of transcription factors in the cell. And it's a code, it's a combinatorial code. Uh, how do I know that? Because there's only about 3,000 transcription, transcription factors. There's about 25,000 genes in your DNA. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between transcription factor and genes. It has to be a combinatorial code. Remember, right at the beginning of the talk, the, you know, the four boxes, I can represent four things, but combinatorially, I can represent 16 things, and in time, I can represent 65,000 things. You remember that? So I've got 3,000 transcription factors, but I can't represent 25,000 genes with it. And the, the complicated factor is that most genes are alternatively spliced. 
which means one gene can produce many, many proteins. There's one gene called DSCAN, which we'll talk about later on, a Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule, which uh, produces 38,000 combinations. <laughs> you get a picture, and 95% of all your genes are multiply spliced. So it's a combinatorial code of transcription factors which activates certain patterns of gene expression. Now, okay, this combinatorial code, when it's like a cloud, it's like a combinatorial soup, and it's a specific memory in a cell. But when a cell divides into two, each daughter cell has a copy of the soup and has the same transcription factors in roughly the same ratio. Now you think that means I've got half the signal, it's a different signal, but there's, feed, there's positive feedback mechanisms which, which then top up the transcription factors, which then amplify. So uh, what, cut a long story short, it means you know, a fraction of the molecules will actually produce the same signal because of these positive feedback. It's like a, in sound, compression technology. A weak signal be boosted to be the same as a strong signal. So, so you know, so it really is like a like a like a like a memory, and the, basically the transcription factors. This code is all powerful because the transcription factors are activating the genes. So it's not just a, a place code for knowing where you are in the cell division process. It's also an activation code for activating certain enzymes and proteins to reproduce. So so yeah, amazing. Okay, so basically this transcription factor code is epigenetic factor which can actually track where you are in this process of cell division. You see. So uh, is, that, is that what decides what kind of a cell you're going to make next? You know, well, no, no. You, you explain that. It, it means basically this, this tra transcription factor code is is all powerful. You see, it's all, it's really powerful because transcription factors acti activate genes, and then genes. You know, once you activate genes, then you can do your you know, methylation, deacetylation is all done by gene activation. So it's this transcription factor code which then can do the other epigenetic modifications, but it's the transcription factors which are all powerful, yeah? And, and so it means that this code can track, you know, as, as the cells divide, it can actually pr provide a com unique combination of transcription factors, not for every single node, not for every single cell, but for, for its critical stages of that development, you see? So it's like a, like a place code. Now, the, the, the fascinating thing is that once you have this code, you can basically then use the transcription factor code to tell a certain cell what to be, to produce, to activate dopamine, or activate you know, muscle, muscle uh, protein, muscle enzymes, do you see? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the transcription factor code, but also the code um, can also, um, once you produce a certain body part, can also program the transition to the next transcription factor state. You see, so it's like a code, but it's also a transitional code, that's uh, what I'm, that's like what a computer. Yeah, yeah. It's like an automata, like in the same way that you, you you're playing a musical tune. You're at a certain stage. You can program the next note, then the next note programs the next note. You see, you see. So, but this basically means you can program the entire uh, path of uh, cell division, right to the end nodes, where basically a muscle cell has to be a muscle cell and a heart cell has to be a muscle, yeah. etc. Okay, now, okay. Uh, okay, no, 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 here's, 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 where we, here's where we take it full circle. Here's where we take it full circle, okay? Um, it's that when we use the same place code to then explain um, basically, okay, Hox genes basically mark out parts of your body, okay, segments of the insect body, but also human bodies. Hox genes in the early embryo, basically, so they segment the body. And they use, do it using chemical gradients. But Hox genes are not involved in the brain, okay? Now, in the brain, we need um, basically a way of specifying very precise regions. 70% so of all your genes are actually involved in the brain, so most of the complexity is in your brain. Other studies think that 84% of all your genes are in your brain, so that's where the action is going on in terms of personality, in terms of complexity, your brain. Okay, now, um, we have this combinatorial code for specifying regions. We also have this kind of um, you know, dividing pattern by which we can actually specify um, codes for specific parts of the brain. Okay. Transcription factor codes. Now, this is where the uh, DSCAM gene comes in. Because uh, the, the, the DSCAM stands for Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule. It's to do with guiding axons. It tells axons where to go, basically. And it produces 38,000 combinations, basically. And what, what are these 38,000 combinations? They're like, they can be conceptualized in, in pairs. So you've got 19,000 locks and you've got 19,000 keys. One lock will fit a certain key. Can you see? Now, if I can specify all these separate brain regions, not to the neuronal level, I don't have to specify every single neuron, I just need to specify patches of cortex. I need to specify areas of the hypothalamus. You see, I give addresses to each of these different brain regions. And I give, I give each of them a, a kind of, a, you know, a transcription factor code. But then, using the uh, DSCAM gene, I can translate the transcription factor code into a DSCAM protein. 
But once I have a D-scan protein, which could either be a lock or a key, I can tell axons precisely where to go because each area of the brain will produce a slightly different D-scan protein. Can you see? So I give each part of the brain a different address, a different label. There's actually a molecule on the surface of the cell that also can diffuse out. Now, the D-scan gene mainly is involved with getting the axons, getting the neuron to not connect to itself, so it avoids itself, so it branches outwards, okay? But with this code in the brain, it means I can precisely wire up different brain regions to different brain regions. I can pre-configure these uh, arrangements. I can tell uh, an axon to loop back on itself and loop back in a particular place. I can also tell certain neurons to become dopamine neurons, certain neurons to be acetylcholine neurons, certain neurons to be pyramidal cells or inhibitory neurons, and using this code, uh, addressing code, I can tell where neurons need to migrate because neurons are producing one part of the brain, then they move to a different part. You see, it's a dressing scheme. Basically, with this um, transcription factor code, this short-term memory coupled with the DSCAM code, I can configure completely with my genome and DNA the basic blueprint of a brain, which is the same for all of us and same, roughly the same for monkeys and chimpanzees. So we come full circle, you see? So we've shown you know, in a very short space of time you know, how a genome has a correspondence with the working of a, of a brain, but also how the genome with this transcription, transcription factor code then create a rough draft of a brain, which then goes on to continue the process of the genome, but in, in terms of behavior and thought. So we come full circle. So basically the genome works like a brain to produce a brain that then works like a big genome. <laughs> okay, okay this, is the, okay, this is the clincher. <laughs> this is uh, cosmic, this is really tantric, this is absolutely <laughs> mind-blowing. The theory, this theory, um, you know, just skimmed over in two hours, it covers vast ways of, you know, territory in two hours, basically shows how life, your life is basically a process of emanating from a fertilized egg. And it's one algorithm because the genome creates the body and then cr the, creates the brain, uh, single emanation, and the brain emanates behavior. And all these emanate, emanating behaviors, they converge to a prime directive. And that prime directive is fertilizing eggs. <laughs> and the cycle begins again. Isn't that astounding? Isn't that astounding? What do you think? <laughs> so I, I guess, uh, you know, so basically, um, you know, you've got a paradigm shift. I mean, this is it. I mean, you've got basically fear of the genome and brain. And uh, basically the idea of emanating from a point to, you know, get to a stage where you fertilize eggs and the cosmic cycle begins again, I, you know, baby cycle begins again. It's basically the universe emanates from a point. The universe is evolutionary. The universe is informational and computational. It, it facilitates this extrapolation of the brain theory to the universe, no end. You know, this, uh, this genomics, uh, the new stuff. And also you heard a talk about genomes and brains, but you've also really heard a talk about artificial intelligence. So if you want a, a paradigm shift, what a paradigm shift involves is something massive, explaining of the genome and brain as one theory, but also the keys to proper artificial intelligence, also the key to explaining how we're all one consciousness, and also the key to reviving the perennial wisdom, the Prisca theologia and the perennial wisdom, and the, you know, the kind of the esoteric religion, essentially. So how's that? So basically, that's it. So, you know, we're going to change the world in one day. We're going to change the world in a couple of years, but that's how you're going to do it. So, you know, so, so I hope I've shown in two hours. It's a quite a short talk. I mean, we've covered vast ways of territory, but I'll, I'll come back in a few months' time to do the, uh, the, the, you know, the kind of um, the AI talk and the, the political talk and the religious talk. So basically, there's lots more to come. Okay, so thanks very much.